KCTV 5's campaign 2024 coverage continues now with a closer look at the biggest statewide race in Missouri. Governor Mike Parson is term limited this year. His handpicked lieutenant governor is hoping to take his place. Mike Kehoe won a crowded Republican primary for the state's top job. The Democratic candidate is state representative Crystal Quaid, who is the minority leader in the state house. I asked them both about the big issues that are important to you, and there is one that they actually agree on. Quite frankly, Missourians are sick of the infighting in politics. Uh, I'm sick of the infighting in politics. And anywhere we go in the state, when I get out of the car, Missourians don't always ask what party you're from. They say, are you getting anything done? And so if God gave me one talent, it's to bring people together. Uh, my reputation in the state Senate and now as lieutenant governor is putting party sh partisanship aside and working with people to find out how we solve the problem. I will honestly say that the divisiveness that I've seen in Jefferson City is one of the reasons I wanted to run for governor. Um, you know, when I first got to Jefferson City, it was very common for folks to work across the aisle and um, or to debate all day and then go have dinner with each other. And, um, you know, compromise is now a dirty word. But I learned really early as a Democrat lawmaker that if I wanted to get something done, I had to be okay with not getting the credit and working with folks on the other side of the aisle. And it is my personal belief that that's how you come up with some of the best policy is having different opinions there. The two certainly have different opinions on the issue of abortion access. Missouri is among 10 states where voters are deciding on an amendment regarding access to abortion. The gubernatorial candidates weighed in on their stand on Amendment 3. I am a huge supporter of Amendment 3. Um, you know, folks probably know that Missouri has the most drastic abortion ban in the entire country without exceptions for rape or incest. And, you know, I've had so many phone calls since uh, the bill went into effect when those trigger laws went in from women who are actively miscarrying, who have gone to one of our local hospitals here and been told you're not close enough yet for it to be a danger, you've got to go home. And they've called me and say, what can I do? And, you know, and it's a devastating conversation. The reality is, is this again is not a partisan issue. Missourians don't want politicians in their personal lives telling them what to do. Well I would like to see and I'd be open to looking at some of the exceptions in the current abortion law and I've said that if the state legislature again should I become governor were to send us some something reasonable I'd take a look at it but I will have to tell you that amendment three goes way too far. It's very extreme and I'm m so much against amendment three. And my wife and I are the parents of four children and we just found out one of those kids is going to give us our first grant child. So protecting innocent life is the number one priority in my mind of any elected official, no matter where they're from or what party they're from. That's the life they can't speak for themselves. Both candidates agree that addressing child care issues is a priority, but they disagree on how best to do that here in the state of Missouri. We work very hard to expand child care options, keeping kids safe, but allowing the private sector to start looking a little harder at the child care options. For instance, here in Springfield, Cox Medical Center now I think has their fifth center within the hospital system where they're using child care as a recruiting tool to bring people into the workforce. Missouri has about $1.4 billion of workforce that sits at home annually because of lack of child care, and we need to improve that. What I will say right now, a huge failure that we have in the state of Missouri, and folks may already know this, the state of Missouri is not even paying its child care bills on time right now for our providers. We've lost over 50 child care providers in the last year, and the state owes hundreds of thousands of dollars each to individual small business owners who are trying to provide care. So in the first 100 days, it would be fixing that mess and making sure that the folks that we do have open are, are able to continue functioning and that we're approving the parents and guardians who are currently waiting. And both candidates do agree it is important to keep the chiefs and royals in Missouri. Kehoe says we need to make sure to get a good return on taxpayer dollars. Quaid says the Parson administration has dropped the ball because there's still not a package to present. She thinks Missouri is lagging behind Kansas at this point. Also up for election in Missouri this year, the Office of Attorney General. Republican Andrew Bailey is seeking his first full term after being appointed to the job by Governor Parson. The Democrat on the ballot is Alad Gross, who ran for this office four years ago but did not win his party's nomination. You heard both governor candidates talk about abortion, and that's one of the other big issues on the Missouri ballot. KCTV5 is sharing the real stories of women at the center of this debate. Angie Riccono talked with women who plan to vote yes on Amendment 3. I felt like my world had just been swept out from underneath my feet. Alice Ledford will openly tell you she's had abortions. 
All were heartbreaking and medically necessary. It was definitely not an easy road to get here, and I would not have made it without those medical abortions. Two were miscarriages, which required surgical procedures. One was an ectopic pregnancy. Now I've just lost this baby that I, I was so super excited about. And that was just absolutely traumatizing. She'll vote yes on Amendment 3, which would repeal Missouri's ban on abortion. When she votes yes, she says she will be thinking of her past and her daughter's future. So if we don't allow medical abortions or we're not actually advocating for all abortions, women are going to suffer. Women are going to die. We're not going to be able to receive the medical care that we deserve when we deserve it. People turn out when abortion is on the ballot, and we're expecting that will be the same in Missouri. I think we'll have high turnout, high voter registration for new voters for whom this is a really deeply held personal issue and they want to vote on it. Emily Wales is the president of Planned Parenthood Great Plains. She says Missouri voters are now aware of the impacts of no abortion access. Melissa Farmer went public after her water broke 18 weeks into her pregnancy. She traveled to three hospitals in three different states to get the care she needed. People know someone who couldn't get care or who had to travel multiple states or who have been waiting for weeks. That has set in and Missourians are not wanting to tolerate that world anymore. They don't want their lives to be at risk. They want to make sure they can make these decisions for themselves. Medicine has become very political um, and when it affects my patients, it's hard not to speak up and speak out. Dr. Natasha Ahmed spoke out after a Missouri patient had a miscarriage and needed treatment. Turned out there was some tissue still there um, and retained tissue in that setting can become infected, can cause a lot of bleeding. A pharmacist initially denied the medication. Under Missouri law, medication abortion is now illegal. Please advise patient to fill across Kansas border. She took to social media posting about what her patient experienced. Do better for women. We don't do abortion care in my practice, but we are seeing the effects of it, even as people that don't provide abortion. And we're seeing the effects of it in our women who are not even seeking abortion care. Angie Riccono, KCTV5 News. At the beginning of this show, we shared the story of a local mother who survived a saline infusion abortion back in 1977. Melissa Oden will vote no on Amendment 3. She's even written a book about her experience called You Carried Me. And you can see both of these stories now on the KCTV 5 News app. Will Missouri join the growing number of states with legal sports betting? Voters will decide, but is Amendment 2 a good bet or a bust? We get both sides at 744. Right about now, you can't turn on the TV without seeing a political ad. And in those ads, you'll hear all kinds of claims and attacks but can you trust what these candidates and campaigns are putting there on the air? KCTV 5 Zach Summers has the answer. I'm running for state senate. Writing self-help books. We have to fight to save it. Channel after channel inundated with candidates vying for your vote. I'll get the government out of your life. First one weather is brought to you by... Broadcast stations like KCTV 5 are required to run them and candidates are allowed to say just about anything they want. The stations have no control, no editorial discretion over the, adver the political advertisements. TV stations are regulated by the Federal Communications Commission, or the FCC. The agency forbids stations from censoring or altering political ads paid for by legally qualified candidates. UMKC political science professor Greg Venami says while candidates can lie in their ads, there are limits. You can't knowingly lie in a way that damages the opinion of another person. You can be sued for that. That's not protected by the First Amendment. Giving politicians the power to take away women's rights. For the most part, the FCC does not review the content of political ads before they air, nor does it ensure the accuracy of statements made by candidates or requires broadcast stations to provide all sides of controversial issues. The rationale is essentially you need to let the candidates speak for themselves. KU professor Janelle Belmas specializes in media law. She says those running for office are required to stand by their ad. It's why you hear candidates say, I approve, I approve this approve message. This, and I approve this message. The idea was if the candidate's name is clearly associated with a, with a mudslinging commercial, then maybe there might be some accountability. I'm not convinced it ever really worked that way. So the next time you see a political ad, Belmas and Vanami agree. 
Do your own research. The voters should take any information, any claim in an advertisement with a grain of salt. Zach Summers, KCTV 5 News. It's almost time to read the political tea leaves. Coming up, Pete Mundo and Sly James are breaking down this campaign and what to expect once the votes are counted. Local, live, America decides. This is a KCTV 5 News election special. I bet by now you've seen an ad or two on television supporting or opposing Amendment 2 in Missouri. That the amendment that would legal, that's the amendment that would legalize sports betting in Missouri. And on Tuesday, voters will decide if the show me state is all in on sports gambling or whether it's time to fold. This TV ad says sports betting in Missouri is a must. Education is really important to me and that's why I'm voting for Amendment 2. This one says sports betting is a bust. Nothing in two guarantees a single penny for education. We asked UMKC political science professor Beth Vanami to break down both ads. Okay, so we've just watched a for and against ad and they couldn't be more polar opposite, yet they're talking about the same thing. How, how is a voter supposed to wade through this? Well, if I were a voter, I would ignore both of these advertisements and I would focus more on how I feel about sports betting and whether I think sports betting is something that should be legal. Amendment 2 seeks to put Missouri in the company of 38 other states that allow sports betting. The Vote Yes ad promotes it would be a boon for education as Missouri would receive millions of dollars in revenue to go to public schools and higher education. By legalizing sports betting, Amendment 2 will generate more than $100 million for our schools over the next five years. But the Vote No advertisement questions just how much money would go to Missouri schools and says those looking to legalize sports betting are being deceptive. Two is a massive expansion of online gambling that allows out-of-state corporations to pay zero to Missouri schools. I also would have people reread the part that talks about the funds going towards education. It doesn't actually say additional funds for education. Sports betting is already legal in Kansas. We've reported on the scores of Missourians who cross the border to make their legal wagers in Kansas. This is video from a recent Sunday morning of people crossing the state line to make their bets before the noon NFL games. All the cars pulled over here in Kansas have Missouri plates. Studies show the fastest growing group getting into legal online sports betting is primarily young men and especially young college men. That's why we came to the University of Kansas to see what we could find out. So we headed to the wheel, popular with students and a longtime Lawrence hotspot. I do a lot of college football and NFL, but I also like hockey, NHL. Tom Couture is all in on online sports betting. The KU senior told me he has six, yes, six sports gambling apps on his phone. I got DraftKings, FanDuel, Caesars, BetMGM, Barstool, and Fanatics. Check Connor Krause's phone and you'll find three sports betting apps. What do you bet on? Pro, college, what is it you bet on? Uh, NFL is definitely my favorite to bet on, but I've been getting into hockey as of last year and it's pretty fun. Every single night I feel like that I go out, somebody is gambling, doing their sports betting on their phone. That's concerning to Kevin Pichotta. The KU assistant professor of finance co-wrote a paper titled Gambling Away Stability, Sports Betting's Impact on Vulnerable Households. He says the first thing he sees with online sports betting is it leads to people who are willing to gamble with money they might ordinarily have saved. We also find that people run up credit card balances. So they're not just substituting away money that they would have put in the savings, but they seem to all be expanding how much money they're accessing through debt. According to Kindbridge Behavioral Health, 20% of the adult male population are now or have been in debt from sports betting. I have a buddy in myself who in a little trouble, but I think it's one of those things that you just kind of have to figure out yourself. I know it's an addiction. The Center for Public Justice says 20 year old males now account for 40% of the calls to hotlines for gambling addiction. Women gamble too. Serena Zakaria started winning immediately after downloading a sports betting app. Then I lost all the money and then I was like, okay, this is just not for me. And then I just deleted the app, never touched it again. But it was fun. Like when I saw me, when I saw that I was making money, I was like, this is exciting. The students we talked with at the wheel say they gamble for fun and are not having any problems. But they do admit that once you download a betting app, gambling becomes 
super simple. And you can also check your bets at any time and tweak them or respond to these promotions that people have for, like you were saying before, bonus bets or um, these uh, yeah, special promoted parlay bets. You can just, as soon as you see the ad, uh, immediately engage. And there are some heavy hitters backing a yes vote on sports betting. The Kansas City Chiefs, Royals, Current, and St. Louis Cardinals and Blues have all endorsed Amendment 2. Missouri voters will also decide on raising the minimum wage again. In 2018, the current increase to $12.30 an hour was passed. Proposition A would boost it to $15 an hour by the year 2026 and give workers one hour of paid sick leave for every 30 hours worked. That could add up to 70 hours a year for full-timers. The Missouri Restaurant Association is opposed, though, arguing the cost would be too much for most small businesses. The end result when you vote for Proposition A will be that you're, you're literally saying, we would like to raise all of our prices at every, on all goods and services in the state of Missouri. Some small businesses are supporting Prop A, though. We visited the Pasta La Fata restaurant in Colombia. The owner told us she believes higher wages and sick leave would lead to less turnover. In fact, she plans to implement those policies even if the proposition does not pass. And one more amendment on Missouri ballots. Amendment 6 would allow court costs to fund sheriffs and prosecutors' pensions across the state. That's how it worked until 2021 when the state Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional. The pension has been underfunded since, could go bankrupt here in the next decade. Opponents do have several concerns. That could potentially create, um, you know, uh, a, a reason for uh, different actors in the criminal legal system to, to make sure that more people end up in courts. Supporters point out that judges can have the fee waived if there is concern about the cost. The two newest members of the Missouri Supreme Court will also be on the ballot. Voters will decide if Judge Ginger Gooch and Kelly Broniak should be retained. In Missouri, judges on the Supreme Court go up for a vote after one year on the bench. Both have rated favorably by the Judicial Performance Review Committee. The KCK School District is asking voters to approve a cheaper bond to help upgrade some of its older buildings. This one is $180 million and will not raise the levy on property taxes. It comes just six months after voters rejected a $400 million bond that also included a tax increase. Now, the money from this bond would go towards an expansion at Sumner Academy, a new building for Central and Argentine Middle Schools, and a new building for Silver City and Noble Prentice Elementaries. All right, it is time now to make some predictions about what will happen when all these votes come in and are ultimately counted. Yeah, we're going to go back to Zach Summers, who's breaking down this campaign with KCTV5's political experts. Election day, just days away. There's a lot on the line, not just in the race for the White House, but local, state, and issue-based races that we will be following here to discuss Pete Mundo, morning host at 95.7 FM KCMO Talk Radio and former Kansas City Mayor Sly James. Let's start with early voting, Pete. We've seen at times long lines, people waiting hours to cast their ballot. What do you think is drawing voters to the polls before Election Day? Well, you're seeing a huge rush of early voting. I think a lot of that is being driven by Republicans who typically wait for Election Day. But now the Republican strategy has been a smart one to say, you know what? If this is the way the game is played, if this is how the rules are, let's get our people out there, vote early. It saves campaigns money. It saves them time. They get to cross people off, off the list once they know they voted. So it's a smart play for Republicans. So I think what you're seeing is Democrats probably voting early just as much as they used to. The ones that did are doing it again. But a big wave of Republican early voters in this cycle, which is why you're seeing longer lines here locally as well the last few days. Yeah, Sly, do you think we'll see record voter turnout this election? I believe that's exactly the case, and I'm not sure that the early voting is endemic or indicative of any Republican uh, acts whatsoever. I think there probably are more Republicans voting early, but I think what we're actually seeing is the beginning of a wave of voters that will reach a record level because people are now understanding how important this election cycle is. Yeah, let's talk about the presidential race. Vice President Kamala Harris could make history becoming the first female president, while former President Donald Trump could win a second term after losing in 2020. Uh, you know, Pete, will this be a close race, or will one of these two candidates take it early? 
Well, I think it's going to be a very close race. Uh, you look at this and all the polling suggests that we are at a coin flip right now, not just nationally, but obviously in a lot of the key battleground states. So I, I don't know if we're going to have an answer come Wednesday morning or even Tuesday night. To me, that's the more intriguing part. How long are we waiting for some of these ballots to be counted? Remember, in 2020, we found out on Saturday after the election that Joe Biden had won that race. So we might be sitting here days on end. I don't think that's good for the country. I don't think it's healthy. I think we want to find out sooner than later. But I unfortunately am fearful that we are going to be sitting around for a little bit trying to find out who won this election. Yeah, I think all Americans would like to know as soon as possible. Sly, what's your take? Well, I think it's going to be a close race, but I'm not sure it's going to be as close as a lot of people think it is. Uh, I do believe that there's probably, you know, people get all hung up on polls, but polls are just a snapshot of what's going on at a particular time. Uh, I think that there will be a, a, a very close race, and I agree with Pete that this is not something we're going to know at the end of Tuesday night or Wednesday morning. And if Donald Trump loses, I think that we will not know the answer for probably weeks thereafter. So at the end of the day, yes, it's going to be close, but I also think it's going to be contentious. Yeah, from the presidential race to the state race in Missouri, uh, you know, Missouri used to be a swing state up until about the early 2000s, firmly red now, of course. But there are several issues on the ballot, abortion, raising the minimum wage, that the left historically supports. Sly, do you think those issues will have an impact on the gubernatorial and U.S. Senate races? Absolutely. I think uh, specifically the abortion issue will drive women to the polls in record numbers and hopefully some men who are like-minded with women in their families or in their orbit. Uh, with regards to minimum wage, I think that is going to be a winner because it's not just minimum wage, it's paid sick leave. And people who have children know the value of having paid sick leave, uh, particularly women, again, who happen to often leave their jobs or whatever they're doing in order to take care of a child that gets sick at school or a child that can't go to school because they are sick. Uh, I think both of those issues will pass, and I think that they are worth passing. Yeah, Pete, do you think uh, in terms of how voters vote, we might see a split where the issues might go one way, but in terms of the candidates, they may go another? Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of ticket splitting in Missouri. I, I agree that right now those two specific amendment issues are more likely to pass than not. But I think that when you look at some of the big statewide races, you look at the governor's race, uh, Mike Kehoe, and then the Senate race, Josh Hawley, they are both in very good positions to get themselves elected. So it's unique because there is right now a populist mentality in Missouri that doesn't necessarily cut the traditional Republican or Democratic way. I would be stunned if any statewide Democrat won in Missouri in this cycle just because of the makeup of the state uh, that you referenced there earlier, Zach. But I do believe that some of these amendment issues that typically lean left have also been very heavily funded by interest groups that want to see those things pass. And that makes a diff big difference as well in these things. Pete Bundo, Sly James, thank you both for your insight. Brad and Carolyn. And thank you, gentlemen. Join KCTV5 on election night because we're going to be breaking down all of the results as the votes are counted. And Pete and Sly are going to join us on air and on the KCTV5 Facebook page. Plus, we're going to have the latest updates on results as they come in on KCTV5.com and the KCTV5 app. And we have all the big races covered on both sides of the state line, of course. Our coverage on Tuesday will begin at 3.30. Then be sure to tune in later that night at 10 o'clock for the victory speeches at the campaigns all across Missouri and Kansas. We do want to thank you for watching KCTV5's Campaign 2024 special. Our coverage continues tonight at 10. Have a great night.